So <clears throat> value investing from an antipodes perspective uh, is not necessarily about buying low multiple stocks. It's about paying the right multiple regardless of what the growth rate is. As a pragmatic value manager, we think you can invest across the growth spectrum. So <clears throat> it's been a tough year, as Matt uh, pointed out, um, and I'll, I'll sort of discuss some of the reasons why. But potentially, you know, the key reason is simply we've had such extreme crowding into long duration assets. Uh, we would say extreme, so for even a pragmatic value style, it's been tough to keep up with the market. So what do I mean about investing across the spectrum of growth? You have stocks like ING that are basically GDP growers, but are trading on a market at less than half the market multiple. And we don't believe they are value traps. We don't believe ING is being disrupted. Then we have portfolio holdings that are growing at GDP plus type growth rates. Air travel, in the case of GE, travels, grows at a roughly 1.3 times GDP. Those businesses are on higher multiples, but they're still cheap relative to that growth. And then we have businesses that are genuinely high growth and have a long runway of growth ahead of them. In the case of Facebook and Alibaba, approximately 20% per annum for roughly a 20 times multiple. So we think they are basically pragmatic value. Now, we wouldn't want a whole portfolio of GDP growers, just as we wouldn't want a whole portfolio of expensive growth stocks. We want cheap stocks across the spectrum of growth. So what do I mean by investors chasing long duration? <clears throat> duration is a simple concept. Uh, it applies to fixed income and equities. It's simply the time taken to repay your purchase price. Sydney, so what are some examples of long duration assets? There's nothing special about them. Sydney property, uh, negative yielding government bonds, of which 40% of the entire stock of government bonds is negative yielding, is probably the ultimate long duration asset because you're paying for the privilege to lend to a sovereign. Uh, at times, growth equities can become, uh, they can become uh, equity expressions of long duration. So the time taken. Now, what are these assets sensitive to? They're sensitive to very low discount rates, especially when those discount rates go lower. That is exactly what we've seen happen over a long period of time and very intensely in the last 12 months. Now, this chart here is measuring a very old-fashioned uh, concept of value, which is price to book. And it's looking at the trend performance of high price to book to low price to book. I can hear the groans in the audience from the growth investors. Yes, we think price to book is very old-fashioned. So let's think about a different, more complex way of thinking about valuation. Um, at Antipodes, we, um, in our, using our internal quant tools, uh, we're using a multi-factor measure of valuation. And on the left-hand side there, we are essentially looking at how a, the top quintile on a sector neutral basis, so we don't want the data to be distorted by one sector that becomes very expensive. On a sector neutral basis, across each sector, what is, what's the, how are the high multiple stocks priced relative to the low multiple stocks? So it's, it's basically valuation dispersion, and we're measuring that at um, enterprise level, EV sales, EV EBITDA, good old-fashioned price to earnings, but it's a multi-factor capture. So we, on a sect sector neutral basis, we're now close to two standard deviations extreme. So investors are paying up for one group of stocks and they're totally ignoring another group, group of stocks. The other question would be is how, uh, how let's call it pervasive, is it between sectors? Um, in the tech bubble, so high multiple dispersion. During the tech bubble, it's surprising, almost all sectors had this characteristic. You had winners and losers. Uh, today, you're starting to get more yellow, more orange, but there is still some sectors where PE dispersion is quite tight. Now, they don't, that doesn't necessarily mean they're cheap. Um, technology is on a higher multiple, but it means there's not as much expectation that there'll be losers in this space. Uh, the relative outcomes are considered to be much tighter. 
So we think there's a good empirical case to be made that the market is systematically, given the very, you know, the collapse in real yields that took place in 2019, the US 10-year nominal bond lost 100 basis points, ended the year around 1.5%. Inflation in the US is running at roughly two. So the US has got negative real yields. Negative real yields are fairly rare. You know, we've had a few, you know, we've had a, a period of negative real yields in Europe, in Japan. But if you go back over hundreds of years of economic history, these periods are relatively rare. But they will distort long duration uh, assets because those assets have the most sensitivity to real yields. So we can think about the valuation in an equity sense. If investors are paying up, tending to chase, uh, sorry, tending, tending to chase after a certain style, growth equities being a good expression of duration, um, that style at a, at a global level is now about 1.4 standard deviations expensive, using quite a long, period of, of history, uh, roughly 25 years of data. And then we also have at the other end, low PE stocks that are about 1.2 standard deviations cheap. In a performance sense, you can see the big gap that's opened up, the systematic outperformance of high growth over lower multiple in the last 13 months. So. We're not saying don't buy growth equities. We're just saying make sure you're buying them at the right price. And we're not saying ignore value equities. Just make sure they're not value traps. But just like there are value traps, there will be growth traps. There will be quality traps. For those of you who remember the tech rec, um, companies like Cisco and Microsoft didn't stop growing. They went through what we call growth purgatory, which is you keep growing, but your share price goes down. Why is your share price going down? Because the market derates the valuation. So you pay the wrong starting multiple. Um, we think there will be lots of growth traps and quality traps going forward. Now, if we think about what potentially changes the current regime, what can unwind these very unique, this very unique set of circumstances of very low real yields? We ultimately think very simply that QE is driving you know, asset inflation. It's not necessarily leading to great economic stimulus. Um, that asset inflation is leading to greater populism and greater populism will ultimately lead to inflation. Now, it may not be now, it's, it's a question of when. And I admit, sitting here right now, it's, it's hard to see where those inflationary pressures are going to come from. Let's think about the ability of governments to stimulate. Um, coronavirus is another reason for a lower cyclical or economic environment or a slower outlook for growth. Um, and we think governments will increasingly look to fiscal stimulus. Uh, the, the economies or the regions that have the most flexibility there would be those who have gone through periods of austerity, so Europe, uh, and those who have, in the case of China, a much lower level of government debt to GDP. Now, the US debt to GDP is similar to Europe, but we're already on the road of fiscal stimulus. So how do we think these economic regions respond to a slower growth or to any type of recessionary outlook? Europe, being more socialist, will likely seek to spend its way out of difficulty. Now, it will probably, that spending will probably come wrapped, it come in a green wrapper. Uh, there's already discussion around a one trillion uh, green Deal. Now, what that money will go to fund subsidies for the adoption of EVs, to accelerate grid investment. But there's a much bigger target that the EU has put out, which is decarbonisation out to 2030. Equivalent of a 2.8 trillion spending program or investment program. Um, how that is funded? Well, 
probably gets funded out of some of that fiscal surplus that Germany has. Um, but it also may get funded via the emissions trading scheme that Europe already has. So there is a $24 a tonne price on carbon. So expect Europe to go green. The US, I think it's less clear. I think the US will probably look to double down on tax cuts. The first round of tax cuts favoured corporates and favoured uh, higher income earners in the US. I think the next round of tax cuts will be very much targeted at the middle class. Um, now, the US has a 4% fiscal deficit. Now, that is typically associated with a time of economic recession, and we are in the US in really uncharted territory. Uh, the Fed is already restarted QE. So for those in the room who think interest rates will never go up, why is the Fed buying short-dated government bonds today? They are buying those bonds to keep interest rates down. So there's pressure already at the short end on interest rates. So prepare yourself for an environment where markets may see QE not about asset prices, but about actually a necessity to finance the fiscal deficit. So we think a lot of the arguments against inflation have very, you know, there are, in terms of aging populations, I would argue, you know, I would argue that does lead to a tighter workforce, a workforce that has more bargaining power. In terms of technology disruption, uh, at the moment, a lot of that disruption is actually creating employment. You know, the gig economy is creating jobs, not destroying jobs. So labour market tightness will ultimately lead to some inflation. How do equities respond to that? Well, in periods of mild inflation, lower multiple, shorter duration equities do much better. Value outperforms growth. In periods of deflation, similar to what we've gone through, it's the opposite. That's the middle chart. And then the final chart is the end of the duration bubble when inflation gets out of control. It gets out of control because central banks and governments in the middle period fight deflation to the point where they actually win. They win because they overstimulate. So what happened in Japan is another interesting case study because we had a period of very low rates, but we actually had an ongoing economic cycle and there were regular rotations between value and growth equities. Um, and point to point, if you adopted a buy and hold strategy, it may surprise you that value actually outperformed growth. I, I would want to re-emphasize though, as a pragmatic value manager, you should be able to ultimately capture alpha from those cycles. Um, but ultimately, you know, when you're buying low multiple, I would stress again, be careful that you're not buying a value trap. So long duration equities are priced for perfection. I think it's very important if you cast your minds back to August last year, there was a small improvement in economic data that drove a violent rotation out of quality growth stocks into lower multiple stocks. You know, <clears throat> that may be a little foretaste of what could come in a much, let's call it, uh, more inflationary economic environment. Secondly, we think there's much more fl you know, fiscal flexibility. Uh, around the world, fiscal tools will be deployed we should prepare ourselves for that. Uh, the world is increasingly looking to decarbonize, probably led by Europe, which will create an interesting investment cycle. Um, and the lesson from Japan, the cycle didn't die. Antipodes portfolio is really taking an almost a barbell type approach to the current environment. When you have these extremes, when you have a whole group of stocks that look really, really cheap and then a whole group of stocks that look very expensive, it's being uh, selective across the choices that you're being offered. At the, the high level here, we have the higher growth, some of the higher growth names. Uh, why do we like Alibaba, Facebook, Uber, social commerce, 
um, has a lot of runway. These are advertising models that are benefiting from um, essentially pricing power. Given their knowledge, the knowledge that they have on you as a user, their ability to personalize ads, uh, we're only paying 22, 23 times, as I said, for, for decent growth. Microsoft, SAP, they're just in the cloud bundling. Microsoft P of 25 is growing faster than it's ever grown in its history. So we're just talking about a business that is in the sweet spot. Uh, and then you have the enablers of EV and cloud adoption, the hardware names like ST, Qualcomm, Samsung Electronics. Amongst the industrials, look for the ones that are secular growth stories. Look for the ones there where there is going to be tailwinds from decarbonisation. Siemens, GE, you know, they have businesses that make utility scale gas turbines, wind turbines, uh, equipment that goes into the modernization of, uh, of the grid that you're going to need as you deploy battery, battery technology. Uh, then you have the pharma space where you've got lower multiple stocks that have traditionally been defensive, but are on PEs of 15 and they do have a decent pipeline uh, that can support their growth. And then in, in, amongst the consumer names, concentrate on names where you are getting protection from some of the disruption that's taking place. Retailers are pushing their private label ahead of traditional brands, but Coke and Pepsi are very close to their final consumer. They control their supply chain all the way down to the final consumer. Now, yes, they're on PEs that are higher than Merck and Roche, but they are also very low risk growth in a world where there's lots, as we know, there is a lot of disruption taking place. Retail banks that are not facing the threat of fintech disruption, and then tail risk protection. Um, I'm going to take one of our more contrarian ideas now and go into a little bit more detail on why we like uh, what is one of the world's greenest aluminium producers, Norsk Hydro. So I'll start with the outlook for aluminium. Um, it has the characteristic as being as strong as steel, but significantly lighter. Uh, now, in a world, but it's much more expensive to make. The world is slowly doing three things. We're making things lighter. We're wanting to make them recyclable. And, uh, you know, wherever possible, we're trying to make them, you know, ultimately greener. So Norsk Hydro and aluminium tick those three boxes. Uh, Give you an example, when you make an EV, uh, because the battery is so heavy, you have to make the rest of the car light. So a high end, a Tesla will essentially have roughly four times as much aluminium content as a normal passenger vehicle. Um, plastic bottles are going out of fashion versus aluminium cans. Um, there's all sorts of growth opportunities. Now, this is not high growth, we just see aluminium demand growing at a roughly 3% per annum. Now, the super cycle is, commodity super cycle, I, I admit, is probably distant in most investors' memories. Uh, but in the case of aluminium, we think it can come again. Uh, we've got a fairly finely balanced supply and demand market. And as you can see from the chart on the right, the valuation of Norsk Hydro is very cheap. Now I'm going to switch to the other side of the barbell. You can understand that Norsk Hydro wouldn't be controversial for a value investor to have some exposure in something this cheap and this neglected. And then you have a company like Uber. Uh, at the other end of the barbell, but we also think very contrarian. Um, Uber is a last mile delivery platform. We think there's a lot of misunderstanding around what Uber is. Many uh, refer to it as a failed unicorn. Um, this is not a concept stock. You know, the, the rideshare business today is larger than the taxi industry. Why have we adopted rideshare? We've adopted rideshare because it's essentially a better mousetrap. Um, it manages the demand for rides with supply. So Uber is a platform, and it's also been able to add delivery of food to the delivery of people. 
and it's been very efficient in the way that it's cross-sold its, its delivery or its eats business alongside food. Um, so you can see from the chart on the left that we expect a hockey stick growth in profits from Uber. Um, we bought the stock very cheaply. To give you some comfort around the valuation, I think it's great to compare Uber against other companies where the market expects a similar hockey stick growth in profitability. And they are companies like uh, Zoom, uh, Slack, high growth SaaS companies that also are not really making a lot of money today. Those stocks are on 20, in excess of 20 times EV to revenue. In the case of Uber, we're talking about a two and a half times EV to revenue. And revenue is essentially what they take after their rider, after their driver is paid. So it's net revenue. When you invest in Antipodes, uh, you're essentially getting a long portfolio, whether you buy the invest in the long short fund or the long only fund, <clears throat> you're getting a portfolio of uh, long investments that are on lower multiples than the market, that are growing at above market rates, that have above market balance sheets in terms of the quality of the, the balance sheet. In the short book of the long short fund, you have stocks that are roughly on double the multiple of our long book that are growing at lesser rates uh, for much for lower quality balance sheets. So our approach to managing risk, uh, we have the opportunities in the long short funds to essentially invest in very cheap downside protection. Uh, we use our approach to clustering to drive research productivity and manage risk. And we build those clusters from stocks that offer us a combination of margin of safety and multiple ways of winning. So thanks for the opportunity to present and I'll hand back to Pinnacle and I'll be back for Q&A.